At 0023 local time on October 6, 2025, 12 Ukrainian operators sit in three hidden bunkers outside Odessa, watching their screens light up. In exactly 47 seconds, they will launch the most complex drone attack in naval warfare history. Their target, the Russian landing ship Olenogorsky Gornyak, a $675 million warship currently docked at Novorossiysk port. Completely unaware, it has less than four hours to live. But first, they need to blind the Russians. At 0024 hours, 48 decoy drones launch simultaneously from positions spread across 15 kilometers of Ukrainian coastline. These aren't military drones. They're modified commercial quadcopters. Each one costs about $800. Total value, $38,400. The Russians are about to waste $50 million worth of missiles shooting them down. Before we begin, make sure to hit like and subscribe. It really helps the channel grow. The moment those 48 motors spin up, every Russian electromagnetic sensor within 20 kilometers goes crazy. The sudden spike in electrical activity lights up their screens like someone just turned on 48 flashlights in a dark room. At the Sevastopol Integrated Air Defense Command, Lieutenant General Volkov sees the incoming swarm and makes the exact decision Ukraine wants him to make. Engage all contacts immediately. This is where the trap springs. Every S-400 missile costs $1.2 million. Every Panzer interceptor costs $140,000. Every Tor missile costs $250,000. The Russians are about to trade Ferraris for bicycles, and they think they're winning. At 00, 26 hours. The first S-400 battery opens fire from position Alpha-7 near Yevpatoria. The massive 48N6E2 missile accelerates to Mach 6 in 12 seconds, racing toward a plastic drone that costs less than an iPhone. The missile's 180kg warhead detonates, turning the $800 drone into confetti. The Russian operators cheer. They just played themselves. Here's what the Russians don't understand yet. Every time they fire, their radar has to paint the target with electromagnetic energy. That energy has a specific frequency, a specific pattern, a specific location. Ukrainian SIGINT, Signals Intelligence teams, are recording everything. It's like the Russians are drawing a map of their own defenses with neon markers. By 00, 29 hours, the Russians have launched 31 interceptor missiles at the decoy swarm. Success rate, 87%. They've destroyed 42 drones worth $33,600 total. Cost to Russia, $14.7 million in missiles alone. But the real cost is much higher. They've just revealed the exact positions of every air defense system protecting Crimea. While this expensive fireworks show lights up the night sky, the real attack force is already moving. These aren't toys from Amazon. These are purpose-built killing machines with names that sound like mythology. Peklo Heavy Strike Drones, UJ-26 Bober Extended Range Platforms, and AQ-400 Scythe Sea Skimmers. At 00, 18 hours, 6 minutes before the decoy launch, the first wave of Bober drones had already taken off from hidden launch sites near Berezivka. Why so early? Because Bobers are marathon runners, not sprinters. Maximum speed, 135 kilometers per hour. Time to target. 2 hours 47 minutes. Each one carries a 50 kilogram penetrator warhead designed to punch through reinforced concrete. At 00, 31 hours, with the Russians still shooting at decoys, the Peklo missiles launch. These are the opposite of Bobers, pure speed demons. 0 to 700 kilometers per hour in 23 seconds. Time to target 41 minutes. Each Peklo carries a 120 kilogram warhead with an imaging seeker that can recognize specific targets from memorized satellite photos. At 00, 33 hours, the AQ-400 scythes join the party. These are the ninjas of the group. They fly just 30 meters above the ocean waves, so low that Earth's curvature hides them from radar until they're basically on top of you. Speed, 290 kilometers per hour. Warhead, 30 kilograms of shaped charge explosive. The timing is everything. Different speeds, different launch times, but all calculated to arrive at their targets within the same 90-second window. It's like ordering pizza, Chinese food, and burgers from different restaurants and having them all arrive at exactly 0, 145 hours. At 0, 0, 35 hours, Russian radar operator Sergeant Dmitry Volkov at Station November 3 notices something weird on his scope. The 96L6E radar, part of the S-400 system, shows targets appearing and disappearing. One second, there's nothing. Next second, there's a contact. Then nothing again. 
This is because the scythes are literally surfing the radar horizon. When they ride up on a wave, they appear. When they dip into a trough, they vanish. The radar computer tries to track them, but keeps losing lock. It's like trying to watch a dolphin from shore. You see it jump, then it's gone. Then it jumps again somewhere else. At 30 meters altitude, the radar horizon for a system positioned at sea level is exactly 19.6 kilometers. The scythes know this. Their flight computers keep them at precisely 27.33 meters. Low enough to hide, high enough to avoid actually hitting the waves. One meter too high, and they're visible from 50 kilometers away. One meter too low, and they're submarine. At 00, 42 hours, the Russians activate their trump card, the KUKA-4 electronic warfare system. This $8 million vehicle starts pumping out 10 kilowatts of jamming power across every GPS frequency. It's like screaming so loud that nobody within 30 kilometers can hear anything else. But the Ukrainian drones don't care. When GPS dies at 00, 43 hours and 12 seconds, their flight computers instantly switch to INS, Inertial Navigation System. Inside each drone, a ring laser gyroscope spins light around a fiber optic loop 100,000 times per second. Any rotation of the drone changes the time it takes light to complete the loop. By measuring these tiny changes, the drone knows exactly how it's moving without any external signal. The INS accuracy, 0.1% drift per hour. Over a two-hour flight, that's 200 meters of error. But the drones don't need to be perfect. They just need to get close enough for their terminal guidance to take over. At 0145 hours, the first strike package reaches inland Crimea, target, Jankoy Railway Junction, the main supply artery feeding Russian forces in southern Ukraine. Three AQ-400 scythes approach at 290 km per hour, 30 meters altitude, following the exact path of the E-105 highway to mask their approach. Russian BTR-82A at checkpoint. 17 spots them at 1.2 km. The gunner has exactly 14.8 seconds to engage before they pass. He opens fire with the PKTM machine gun. 800 rounds per minute of 7.62 mm bullets, but hitting a target moving 80 meters per second at that angle requires leading by 18 meters. By the time he calculates the lead, they're gone. The first scythe slams into the rail signal box at 01 the 46, 07. The 30 kilogram shaped charge punches through 400 millimeters of reinforced concrete like it's cardboard. The signal system dies instantly. Every train within 50 kilometers automatically stops, safety protocol. The second and third sides hit the switching points at 01, 46, 09, and 01 to 46, 011. These aren't random strikes. Ukrainian intelligence studied this junction for months. They know destroying these specific switches will take 72 hours minimum to repair. For three days, nothing moves through this junction. At 0147 hours, four Bobers and one Peklo converge on Ammunition Storage Site 7 near Armyansk. This facility holds 1,200 tons of artillery shells for the 18th Combined Arms Army. The Russians think it's safe. It's 45 kilometers from the front line, surrounded by S-300 batteries, protected by two Panzer systems. The first Bober impacts the perimeter fence at 01, 47, 33. Its 50 kilogram warhead seems wasted on a fence, but this is intentional. The explosion creates a gap, and more importantly, a smoke cloud. For 12 seconds, thermal imaging can't see through the carbon particles in the air. During those 12 seconds, three more Bobers and the Peklo slip through undetected. The Peklo's imaging seeker has memorized what Russian 152mm shell crates look like from satellite photos. It finds the biggest concentration and dives. At 01 at 47, 51, the Peklo's 120kg warhead detonates in the middle of Storage Building 3. The initial explosion is just the trigger. One millisecond later, 400 tons of artillery shells start chain reacting. Two milliseconds later, the building doesn't exist anymore. Three milliseconds later, the shockwave hits storage building four. The explosion registers 2.1 on the Richter scale. Windows break eight kilometers away. The mushroom cloud climbs to 2,100 meters. Estimated damage, $87 million in ammunition, four months of shell production, gone in three milliseconds. While Crimea burns, 10 drones are screaming toward Feodosia Port's fuel terminal. This is the big prize. 14 storage tanks holding 120,000 tons of diesel and aviation fuel. Without this fuel, every Russian vehicle in southern Ukraine stops moving. At 01, 51 hours, Panzer system at grid reference 44.5521.
35.3792, gets the first lock. The operator sees 10 targets approaching at different altitudes, different speeds, different angles. His 57 E6 missiles can engage two targets simultaneously. He has 1.3 seconds to decide which two. He chooses wrong. The two high-altitude drones he engages are the slowest ones. Easy kills, but lowest priority. While his missiles chase them, eight others slip past. By the time he can re-engage, they're inside his minimum range. The Panzer's guns can't depress below minus five degrees. At 300 meters distance and 30 meters altitude, the drones are geometrically impossible to hit. At 0-1, 52. 17. The first drone hits Tank 7, a massive cylinder holding 15,000 tons of diesel. The explosion punches a 2-meter hole at exactly 4.5 meters height, calculated to be above the fuel line but below the vapor space. This prevents immediate ignition but ensures maximum fuel spillage. At 01, 52, 19, the second drone hits the same tank, same height, opposite side. Now fuel is pouring out from two holes at 300 liters per second. At 01, 52, 22, the third drone carries white phosphorus incendiary. It doesn't aim for the tank. It aims for the growing pool of fuel spreading across the containment area. Tank 7 explodes at 01, 52, 31, launching its 500 ton roof 200 meters into the air. This pattern repeats across the tank farm. Precise hits, calculated damage, inevitable ignition, by 01, 54 hours, seven tanks are burning. The heat is so intense that Tank 11, completely undamaged, starts boiling anyway. Its safety valves release, adding more fuel vapor to the inferno. At 01, 47 hours, while everyone's watching the fires, six Ukrainian sea drones slip out of hidden bays near Odessa. These aren't regular boats with remote controls. These are purpose-built naval killers. The Sea Baby Mark V, 5, 5.5 meters long, 850 kilograms total weight, 200 kilogram warhead, maximum speed 42 knots, 78 kilometers per hour, cost to build, $46,000. Extish. The Magura, a 5, 7 meters long, 1,100 kilograms weight, 320 kilogram warhead, maximum speed 48 knots, cost $67,000. Their target, the Olenogorsky Gornyak, a Ropucha-class landing ship built in 1976, currently docked at Novorossiysk, value $675 million. It's the last operational landing ship in the Black Sea Fleet capable of carrying main battle tanks. The sea drones don't take a direct route. That would be suicide. Instead, they follow commercial shipping lanes, hiding in the radar shadows of cargo vessels. When the bulk carrier Volga Dream passes two kilometers from Novorossiysk at 02, 11 hours, three sea babies tuck behind it, invisible to Russian coastal radar. At 02, 23 hours, Russian coastal defense picks up intermittent contacts on radar, but the returns are weird. They appear for two seconds, disappear for eight, appear again somewhere else. The operator thinks it's wave clutter. It's actually the drones surfing waves. When they ride up a wave, they're visible. When they slide down the back, they disappear below the radar horizon. The drones are also smart about their electromagnetic signature. They emit no radio signals, except for a 100 millisecond burst every 30 seconds, just enough for operators to confirm they're on course. The rest of the time, they're electromagnetically invisible. At 02, 34 hours, the lead Magura 55 is 800 meters from the Olenogorsky Gornyak. The operator, sitting in a bunk 180 kilometers away, takes manual control. Through a satellite data link, he can see the live camera feed. Grainy, green-tinted night vision, but clear enough to see individual sailors smoking on deck. At 02, 35, 44, the operator picks his impact point. Two meters below the waterline, 38 meters from the bow, directly under the engine room. This isn't random. Ukrainian intelligence knows from stolen blueprints that this spot has the thinnest armor, just eight millimeters of steel. At 02, 36, 17, the Magura hits the Olenogorsky Gornyak at 48 knots. The 320 kilogram warhead detonates on impact. The explosion creates an instantaneous cavity in the water, eight meters wide. Water pressure at two meters depth is 1.2 atmospheres. When the cavity collapses 0.3 seconds later, it generates a secondary pressure wave of 15,000 PSI. The combined effect tears a hole six meters wide in the hull. Seawater rushes in at 14,000 liters per second. The engine room floods in 47 seconds. 
Without power, pumps stop. Emergency lighting fails. The ship immediately lists seven degrees to port. At 02, 36, 51, the second Sea Baby hits 15 meters behind the first impact. This warhead is different. Thermite incendiary designed to burn through bulkheads. It punches through the hull and ignites inside the fuel bunker. Diesel fuel doesn't explode like in movies. It burns, slowly, intensely, impossible to extinguish with water. At 02, 37, 23, the third drone aims for the propeller shaft. When it detonates, it doesn't just damage the propeller, it bends the shaft 11 degrees. Even if the ship somehow survives, it will never move under its own power again. By 02, 40 hours, the Olenogorsky Gornyak is listing 18 degrees. The captain orders a Bandan ship at 0241. But there's a problem. The lifeboats on the port side are underwater. The ones on the starboard side can't launch because of the list angle. Sailors jump directly into the harbor. In October, the Black Sea temperature is 14 degrees Celsius. Without survival suits, they have maybe 30 minutes before hypothermia sets in. At 02, 44 hours, the ship's list reaches 35 degrees. Internal bulkheads, designed to withstand 15 degrees of list, start failing. Each failure floods another compartment, increasing the list, causing more failures. Naval architects call this progressive flooding. Once it starts, it's unstoppable. At 02, 47, 33, 4 hours and 24 minutes after the first drone launched, the Olenogorsky Gornyak capsizes completely. The ship that survived 49 years of service, that transported thousands of tanks and vehicles, destroyed by three robot boats built in a garage. The aftermath. At 0800 hours, Russian Ministry of Defense releases a statement. Ukrainian terrorist attack largely repelled, minor damage to port infrastructure, no significant losses. At 08, 15 hours, commercial satellites release images showing the Olenogorsky Gornyak upside down in Novorossiysk Harbor, seven fuel tanks still burning at Feodosia, ammunition depot crater visible from space, railroad tracks twisted like spaghetti. The images go viral, Russian Navy sleepers, with fishes trends worldwide. The minor damage becomes a global meme, but the real damage isn't the money or the embarrassment. It's the fear. Every Russian ship captain now knows that any night, robot boats could come for them. Every ammunition depot commander knows drones can appear from nowhere. Every train engineer checks the sky constantly. This attack proves three game-changing facts. First, naval superiority means nothing against swarm tactics. The Olenogorsky Gornyak had defensive weapons worth $50 million, useless against a drone moving three meters above water at 48 knots in darkness. Second, electronic warfare isn't a magic shield. The Russians jammed GPS perfectly. The drones didn't care. INS, fiber optics, and human operators beat billion-dollar jamming systems. Third, cost asymmetry is the new king of warfare. Why build a $2 billion destroyer when $2 million in drones can sink it? In the Ukrainian bunkers, operators watched their screens as months of planning executed perfectly. These weren't soldiers in the traditional sense. Some were gamers, some were engineers, some were university students who grew up flying racing drones. In Russian defensive positions, professional soldiers with decades of training discovered their expertise was obsolete. You can't use tactics from 1980 against technology from 2025.